Baker spent a long time in the computer industry. I've been an electrical engineer. I've been a software engineer. I've actually helped to design operating systems and compilers. I've done a wide range of things. And in 1994, I helped to fund a 64-bit computer system for Linus Torvalds so he could take Linux and turn it from a 32-bit operating system on a complex instruction set computer and make it into a portable operating system on a 64-bit RISC architecture. So that's my claim to fame when it comes to computers. Now, these days, I keep hearing people say, computers are fast enough. You know, the computer on my desktop is fast enough. I don't need anything any faster than that. And then some people will say, oh, Java is the only language we need. Other people will say, nobody codes in assembler language anymore, or machine language, the ones and zeros that make the machine work. And virtual machines and other types of abstractions remove the need for knowing this performance style of work. And to all of that, I say, crap. It's all crap. Because when it comes to performance, when I do programming, I do programming for what I call real problems. I don't do much programming anymore, but when I do, I don't code some stinking tiny little game. I don't code an app for your cell phone. I code where there's petabytes of data. And I code when I have to do real time. The nuclear power plant is melting. How fast can you lower the rods to keep it from exploding? That is real programming. That is a real job. That's the type of stuff I do. And when well, speaking of real time, there's two types of real time. There's hard real time, where you constantly have the processor looking at that particular subject. And then there's soft real time, where you may be able to use the computer system as a time sharing system or as a server, but the moment that that interrupt comes in to tell you that something is about to happen, you need to be able to give all the resources of that system to solving that problem. And for those of you who follow the kernel and the things that are happening inside the kernel, recently there was a big advance in being able to schedule real-time work inside the kernel in a better fashion. Now, I remember in 1995 talking with Linus Torvalds and saying, Linus, in order to make Linux a better kernel for commercial style of work, we need to improve the soft real-time in the system. Notice I wasn't asking for hard real-time. I knew that wasn't the time to ask for it. But I was just asking for better soft real-time. And Lena says, what do you mean? The soft real-time is fine. I said, Lena, how can you say that? He goes, well, when I'm playing Quake and the monster has a gun in its hand, the monster points a gun at me, I hit the key, and I kill the monster. That's soft real time. I said, Linus, put a real gun into the hands of the monster and see if you still feel you have good enough soft real time. Because the definition of soft real time is that you can come back and put the processor's capabilities on the problem when you need them. And this meant that Linus could trust that if he hit that key, that Linux would take the motion to stop the monster. And Linus thought about this for a couple seconds and said, OK, I know what you mean. And the next release of Linux, the soft real time was much better. Cell phone applications, oh yes, they, they're fast enough. 
I mean, after all, you're listening, you can hear the voice. It's not going like this, so it must be fast enough. But it's the opposite side with cell phones. You want the application to finish as quickly as possible so that your operating system can go to a lower level of performance. You can turn down the, um, the clock. You can make your cell phone go slower. You can make your battery life last longer. The same thing is true of servers, believe it or not. Yes, you plug your server in, but if your server system can finish the process, finish the task, the server can turn down disks, the server can turn off memory, the server can save a lot of electricity, and that means it's saving you money. And all of this has to do with the performance, the efficiency of your program. This means we're saving the environment and we're saving money. Now, in addition to all of this, there are some new advancements coming out. Field programmable gate arrays. We've had field programmable gate arrays since the dawn of time, but they were really, really expensive. Today, you can get a field programmable gate array for a couple of dollars. And this means that you can code certain algorithms to be extremely fast. Small ones, not gigantic ones, but small ones, gigantically fast. And while we're talking about small and gigantic, let me tell you, thousands of bytes of memory. We'll see more about that in a moment. We also have digital signal processing chips, and we have multi-core CPUs. These are things we didn't have 20 years ago. I'd like to introduce you to the first machine I ever programmed on. It was actually the second machine, a PDP-8 machine. It had a very nice instruction set. Every single instruction was exactly the same length. And there was only eight of them. The machine was so stupid that it couldn't subtract. If you wanted it to subtract, you had to take the two's complement and add it. It obviously couldn't multiply or divide. Those were all done by adding and subtracting. It only had 4,000 words of memory, and yet, we did real work with this machine. Later on, there were operating systems like CPM, which had 64,000 bytes of memory. We had an operating system, we had databases in there, and we had data in a machine that had 64,000 bytes of memory. Today, the keyboard driver for the Linux kernel is 64,000 bytes of memory. I have no idea what is happening in the keyboard driver that it needs 64,000 bytes of memory. It's actually quite frightening. Mm -hmm. So, to write really good code, in my estimation, you really need to understand the machine architecture. You need to understand how the machine is put together and that means you need to understand machine language. You don't have to understand every machine language because they're all different as you go from machine to machine. But you need to understand the principles of how it works. And you need to understand what terms like cache memory means, bus speeds, cycle times, those types of things. You're not going to be programming in machine language, but you're going to be changing the way you write your higher level code because you know what the machine is generating. Here are some examples from my own past where knowing machine language really helped out. Back in 1973, I was working for a large insurance company and they of course used the COBOL language. The language which Grace Mary Hopper, those who came in late, nanosecond is, but Grace Mary Hopper helped to develop that language. 
And every once in a while, the COBOL programmer would come to me and say, John, I've looked at this code over and over again. I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. Now, I knew COBOL. I don't like to program in it. It's not that bad a language, but I never programmed. But I would look at it and say, I don't see what you've done wrong either. Maybe the compiler made a mistake. The compiler made a mistake? The compiler made a mistake? I says, yes. The compiler is a program just like the program you wrote. And maybe the compiler writer came in that morning hungover from a weekend of partying, hasn't had their first cup of coffee yet, wrote those couple lines that created that bug in the compiler that generated bad code that told the machine to do what you didn't want it to. So we would take the compiler and say, generate the machine language. I would look at the statement he had coded. I would look at the machine language and say, here, you can see the compiler is not generating the right thing. If I didn't know that, if I didn't understand that compiler, that assembly language, I never could have figured that out. We would have been staying there for the rest of our lives trying to figure it out because he had coded the proper COBOL. I was working on a program on a large IBM mainframe. I should explain to you that Aetna was the largest commercial user of IBM equipment in the free world. We automatically ordered two of everything that IBM announced. No salesperson had to call us. IBM announced it, we'll take two. We had a three acre computer center in 1973. We had 500,000 magnetic tapes in our tape library on site. We had a whole, we had 500 3330 disk drives hooked up to one file on one program, on one system. And each one of those disk drives cost 30,000 US dollars. To put this in perspective, my parents bought a brand new house at that time for $30,000. So we had 500 houses hooked up to our program. In any case, we had this one program that when it ran, every program on the system slowed down. Not only that, but every program on every other system, even remotely attached to that system, slowed down. I was assigned to find out why. And I found out that the programmer had used this instruction called read the clock. Read a 64-bit number into the register. Why was that such a horrible instruction? When you studied that instruction, you found out that it was used to synchronize symmetrical multiprocessing systems. And that it was used to create an atomic lock that kept all the other systems from interfering with the first system. And so every single piece of I.O. had to stop. Every single piece of memory had to be flushed. Every single piece of cache had to be written out to memory. Every single register had to be stored, and then the computer system read the clock. And then everything started back up again. And I asked the programmer why he was reading the clock 300,000 times a minute. He said it was to find out what day it was. The next month that programmer was fired. <laughs> Cache memory. Cache memory is very important because it is the thing which bridges the gap between the very slow RAM memory you have and registers that are very, very, very fast. Okay? Cache memory reads a block of memory from the slow RAM memory and then feeds it into the registers. Well, if you have two very large arrays, which you're trying to multiply together, and you do the multiplication like an algebra student learns it in ninth grade, 
you find out that on the first array, everything's going fine. But on the second array, every access to a variable has to go all the way out to main memory because of what we call a cache miss. If you invert the second array, do your multiplication, and then invert the answer, you get exactly the same result, but it goes 40 times faster. These are the things that you begin to understand when you start to understand machine architecture. Today, college students are coming into university knowing less about how the computer actually works than they did 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, they would get these great computers like the Amiga or other ones. They would have the programs in magazines. They would type the programs into the memory and sometimes they would get a syntax error. And they would have to figure out why they got this error, what was wrong, what was the mistake they had. Today, a student goes down to the store, they buy a computer system, they never open it up. They simply put a game on it and they play a game. There's no understanding of how it works. There's no understanding of what the computer is. In a select few group, yes. Maybe some of you out there look beyond that. But there's a lot of students coming into university today who think that the computer is going to think for them. Boy, do they have a surprise. <laughs> They're about to run into the stupidest thing on the face of the earth. That's how most high school students see a computer. And in reality, the computer is really more like this. And you need to understand what all those blocks are. And once you do, you can start to write really good code. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation, some professors in Cambridge, England, decided to create the Raspberry Pi. No case, forcing the students to understand that this is a piece of hardware, nothing magical. And getting them to actually understand the parts of the Raspberry Pi that go in together. But the Raspberry Pi is kind of the high school student's computer. I'll explain that in a moment. Here's the Raspberry Pi. It costs 35 US dollars in the United States. It costs about 170 reais here in, Brit in, in Brazil. I'm sorry about that. It's not my fault. But it's a single core chip. It's not multi-core. Very hard to practice, you know, multi-core programming. It's got a fairly decent graphical processing system for low-end 3D. It has USB 2.0. Everything else is, is pretty good. It has general purpose I.O. pins for you to go ahead and build electrical circuits. Very nice. But there's a whole series of little computers coming out which have better facilities than the Raspberry Pi. Some of them have two cores in the CPU. Some have four cores in the CPU. One of them has a CPU that has four cores that runs at a low frequency and uses a very little bit of power. And it has another CPU that has four cores that runs at a higher frequency and uses more electrical power. Most of the time, the operating system runs over here using a small amount of electrical power. But as the, as the load grows, the other cores are used to get the processors, to get the process done and to go back to low state again. That's called the little big model of programming. This one, these, these, core, these systems up here are all ARM chips of different types. This system here in the lower right-hand corner is a new Gal Galileo system that came out from Intel. Uh, they're going to have a workshop on it tomorrow at 2.45. You might want to take a look at that. 
It uses an Intel 32-bit CPU that is Intel Instruction Set compatible. And it is also compatible with the shields of the Arduino. And they've taken a lot of work to make sure that it's source code compatible with a lot of the Arduino uh, sketches that you could do. You can also use them on the Galileo. But those are still relatively simple systems. This is a nice little system. It's from a company called Adaptiva. It's called the Parallela Board. It has a, two, uh, a system on a chip that has a two-core ARM processor on it, but it also has a field programmable gate array and some digital signal processing chips. In addition to that, it has a CPU that has 16 cores, where each one of the cores has 32K of memory assigned only to that core. Underneath of that, there is a mesh, a mesh memory controller that allows you to move memory back and forth between the cores at the rate of 32 gigabytes a second. This is what I call the university student's Raspberry Pi because this is interesting to program. The Raspberry Pi for me is uninteresting. This is interesting for me, okay? So this is the point I'm trying to get across. Here's the parallela in detail. And you, you basically are getting, oops, I went backwards, I'm sorry. You're basically getting all of this for $99 US. Now, this brings me to the core of what we're talking about in this, in this lecture. GNU Linux has been around for about 20 years. In 1994, I saw my first GNU Linux distribution. It was called Yggdrasil, and I've been using it ever since. But a lot of the programs and everything for GNU Linux were designed even before that. They were part of Unix. So commands like ls, grep, you know, regular expressions, all that stuff came from machines who at the best had 64,000 bytes of memory. And they were working on single-threaded CPUs. There wasn't even symmetrical multiprocessing back then, not in the machines that Unix ran on. And consequently, a lot of these programs had assembly language in them because people were making the trade-offs of having assembly language programmed to be really, really fast versus using the compiler with the upper level language that made it much easier to maintain. So, we move forward. Every time there's another architecture that comes out, whether it be Intel versus AMD versus uh, PowerPC versus ARM, those assembly language instructions have to be rewritten into the assembly language of the new processor. When we move from 32 bits to 64 bits, a lot of times the architecture forces that to be written again. So there's a lot of assembly language which has been rewritten over the years, sometimes very sloppily. Nothing against the people that wrote it, but they hadn't had their coffee yet. And what they did was they looked at the assembly language that was there and tried to pick out instructions for the new assembly language that kind of matched up. They didn't look for the best assembly language instructions of the new architecture. Also in the meantime, the GNU compilers were becoming better, more efficient. I remember when there was only one optimization switch for the GNU compiler, the big O. Now there's many of them. And there's also many switches for different types of architectures. But how many people have gone back to the make files and said, oh, are we using the proper optimizations for this code? There's a lot of code there that's crufty. It's old. And maybe this is the time that we should be looking at it and saying, let's get rid of the assembly language. Or let's rewrite the assembly language so it makes some sense 
when we absolutely have to use it. The reason that we're bringing this up at this point is, is because ARM is making a 64-bit processor. And they looked at the GNU code and they found out that there was over 1,400 different modules in GNU that have assembly language in them. Now some of these modules, all you have to do is recompile them and they will work. Other modules will have to have some assembly language tweaking in order to make them work. And some of them, it would really be a lot better if we simply ripped out the assembly language and let the compiler do the work that it was supposed to be doing. But this takes modules will have to be analyzed and tested to make sure that they are still working after the work is done. So Linero, which is an association of companies that make ARM chips, decided to hire me to analyze this and to create a contest where we not only port the code from ARM32 to ARM64, that's very boring work. I wouldn't ask any of you to do that. But we optimize the code to make it run faster. And if we can get 10% better speed for GNU Linux out of doing this, that would be wonderful. But I can tell you we might get a lot more. Because in my opinion, I have taken programs that ran in 10 and a half hours on one machine, and by changing the algorithm, made them run in three minutes. I have taken programs that ran in 15 hours. I changed one line of code, and they ran in five hours. So we might be able to find a change to an algorithm or something in the code to make it a lot faster. Let's see. So what we want people to do is module by module, look at the code, measure the performance ahead of time, see if they can do some optimization, measure the performance afterwards, and submit it to the contest. And the person who does the best job of optimization will win a pretty nice prize. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. The goals of our contest are to simply get these modules ported. But if we can get them to eliminate the assembly language, then we'll have done this for all of time. We'll never have to do this again. Because when the next piece of architecture comes out, they'll simply add that architecture to the compiler and tell it compile. And then the work will be done. If we still have to have assembly language in there, it'll be in much fewer modules, which we'll be able to keep track of much better. And we hope that out of this contest, we generate enough knowledge that we can actually develop a course on performance, a course telling people how to write good code to make it work really fast. Here's the types of categories of performance that we're looking for. A percentage speed up, so that if the, if the program took one hour to run before, it now takes 30 minutes. Or a reduction in the amount of memory it uses. I have a friend of mine who has one of the parallel boards. One of the algorithms that we would like to use with it uses 128 kilobytes of memory. He found out he could use a different algorithm that fit very nicely into the 32 bytes of memory that each core has. So by changing the algorithm, he can make that program go 16 times faster on the parallel board. We want to be able to use cacheization. Caches are a lot bigger than they used to be. The PDP-8 didn't even have a cache. So if we get better cash, we get better speed out of the program. 
a better algorithm replacement. There's a lot of new algorithms that have happened in the last 20 years. Maybe we can utilize some of those algorithms to speed things up. Many compiler improvements have been done. Just recompiling the code might be able to see some performance improvements. And there's probably a lot of other places we could have that is also part of the contest. Here are some of the prizes that people will get. We're going to give away golf shirts just for entering the contest. If you, if you may find a module, you compile it, it works. You say, I compiled it, it worked, I tested it, you get a golf shirt. Has Lanero on it. May not have performance expert on the back, but it'll be a nice prize. We will then take your name and a pool. There's 1,400 modules. You will have one chance in 1,400 of winning the grand prize. If you then select another module and work on that, and you finish it, now you have two chances out of 1,400 to win the grand prize. If you do three modules and so forth. But there's more. We're going to be doing this over the course of two years. There's going to be four grand prizes. If you start right away, your, your entry stays in the pool. We don't take it out at the end of the first drawing. So you actually get four times the 1,400. So you have a lot of chances to win this. What will you win? You may win some ARM development systems. A lot of times these new ARM development systems cost several hundred dollars. And we may have a sprint where you have a chance to win one of the ARM development systems. But the grand prize is going to be to come to a Connect meeting. Every year, Lanero has two meetings around the world, one in the United States and one in Asia. And every Connect meeting, we will select somebody out of the pool to come to a Connect meeting. And there you'll talk about what you did and you'll be able to say, yes, I did this. And you'll be able to meet all these engineers who are extremely smart, who are working on ARM, and in the kernel, in utilities, in the compilers, in the tool chains. You'll be able to sit down, talk with them, and exchange ideas. All of that will be free of cost. Your, all your transportation expenses will be paid. There are side effects of this, even if you don't win. You're going to be learning a really cool assembly language. This is, the ARM assembly language is a RISC assembly language. Every machine cycle, you pull an instruction out. So if you write something in a high-level language, you say generate the machine language, you can see maybe your first attempt, there's this many instructions that are generated. You tweak your source code. Compile again, all of a sudden you see the number of, of, of instructions shrink. It's visible that this is going to run faster. If you try and do this with a CISC computer, it may or may not be true. Because sometimes fewer instructions will actually take longer to run because the instructions that are being chosen are, you know, take longer for each instruction. So you'll be learning a really cool assembly language that's used in a lot of embedded systems and servers. You're going to be learning code analysis techniques. You'll be able to figure out how your code works. We have forums set up where people can discuss things in the forums to say, hey, I've been having problems with this, and experts can come in and help you out. You'll be able to create an open source portfolio. What we're doing is we're saying to people, you're going to be taking a module out of GNU Linux. You have to contact the upstream people who are normally working on this, tell them you're working on this, submit a bug, submit the code patch, work with them. This is the same thing you do when you work with open source every day. And you'll be able to create a portfolio of programs that you can show prospective employers to say, this is the way I code, this is the way I work with other people, You'll be able to get letters of recommendation that will help you get a job. This is true life programming. It's not doing some type of, of little task that nobody will ever look at again. 
And we're going to try to make a university level course in optimization on this and perhaps to do some real research on things. My friend who's working on the parallel board looked at a lot of different implementations of the algorithm he was looking at. All of the implementations were optimized. He said, what happens if I take the unoptimized version and look at that? And from that, it was clear what he had to do. I said, that was a really good thing. You need to write this up for a magazine like the Linux, the Linux Pro Magazine so that people can see the type of process you have in thinking. This type of a program could, could really make you and get you out there and get, be visible. Let's see. We're also going to have mentors, and we need mentors. We're going to be having engineers from Lanero mentoring people. We're looking for college professors who would like to mentor people and, and help them with particularly hard problems. So we're going to ask you to, uh, to turn in certain pieces of information, particularly in the performance areas because we want to see the test of performance before the module was worked on and the performance afterwards. And we will have the person who wins the contest, we're going to have an engineer evaluate their work to make sure that they actually got that performance improvement from the work they did. Let's see. So these are the types of questions that you'll have to answer when you make your, when you make your presentation. What would the performance level increase overall? What were the performance levels before you started your work and after? And what tests did you do to test the patch? We want to make sure we also don't inversely impact other architectures. We don't want ARM to get better and Intel to get worse. That's not fair. We want, it, we want the performance to go across the board, or not at all. So there are some resources that we can tell you about right now. These are books which are very good on both GCC, the compiler, and the types of optimizations it does. If you write with a GCC compiler and you don't have one of these books, you're not really being fair to yourself. You need to get these and read them. Here's the ARM assembly language. This is like the, the, the Bible of ARM assembly language that's available. The time frame for the contest is more or less immediately. We have all the rules on up. We are getting uh, final approval on those. We're going to create examples of the contest input and output from some engineers at Lanero. And we want to have the final judging of the porting part of this done by 2014 but the performance work will go into 2015. We're also looking for a university to host this because we want this to eventually be neutral across architectures, so we feel the best thing is to move it out of Lanero into a university uh, eventually. So with that, this is the end of my talk. Questions or comments? I'll be around for the rest of campus party. If, you, if you're from a university and you'd like to become more involved with this, I have a university professor who is using this with his assembly language class. Rather than give them crappy little programs to work on that nobody ever looks at, he's actually giving them some of these modules to port and to improve as part of their project for their assembly language course. Okay. This is a nanosecond. Who is the person who first aligns the nanosecond with this wire? What was her name? Oh, you people. Not fans of history at all. What was her rank in the Navy? What? That's right, she was a rear admiral. Okay, thank you very much for coming. I'll be around for the rest of the week. And if you have any questions or comments about the contest, um, I may even have 
an ARM processor or two to give away to a deserving person. So thank you very much.